Well, hello there and welcome to Northern Nevada here in Elko County, looking at a really interesting landscape with these rounded boulders, just like this one sitting here behind me. Let's see if we can investigate this together in a little bit of detail and then learn a little bit more about how this landscape came to be. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. So what we have here, turn the camera around a bit for you, is a landscape of immense rounded boulders, boulders that range in size from, I don't know, maybe a meter or so across a yard, three feet, up to like massive boulders, like this one tucked away back here that's, gosh, maybe five meters across, 15 to 18 feet in diameter. Just crazy, this landscape here. So as we look at these rocks and all the rounding and the boulders that are just kind of dropped on this landscape here in the deserts of Nevada, we might start to think about what processes um, have come into play to present this geologic riddle we have before us. First thing that might be helpful, of course, is looking at the rocks themselves. We can see these rocks are crystalline. They are made out of visible crystals all interlocking, what we would call a phaneritic texture. So this is an igneous rock. The crystals are pieces of plagioclase. There's nice little squares and rectangles up here of plagioclase and case bar, uh, black needle-like minerals in here, such as this one right here of hornblende. So we have a variety of minerals in this rock. This is a granitic rock. I believe it's a granodiorite. So it's not quite felsic enough to be granite, a little bit more mafic, but not quite mafic to be a diorite, a granodiorite. But nonetheless, this was a magma body that cooled and crystallized during the Jurassic period, let's say maybe 160 to 180 or so million years ago. So that's the rock type we're dealing with here. But the real mystery and the real reason we're here is figuring out this landscape of these rounded rocks. So you might consider the ways in which rocks like this might get deposited. What are the processes that are possible? And one possible process would be fast moving water. We would need quite a bit of water uh, to move rocks of this immense size, but I suppose we could have an enormous flooding event that could transport these rocks. Um, that would also account for the rounding because the particles would be colliding with each other and rounding, uh, breaking off the corners over time. The other possible process that we must consider is glaciers. Glaciers can transport rocks of all uh, sizes, um, they tend to be a little bit more angular though, so the fact that so many of these rocks are somewhat rounded um, does not jive so well with our glacial hypothesis. And there might be some other reasons, but let's just entertain those two for a second. One problem with both of those hypotheses is as we look around at these rounded rocks, they're all the same material. It's all this Jurassic granodiorite, every single boulder here. I'm not seeing any rocks on the landscape, small or large, that are any other rock than this Jurassic granodiorite. And in a stream system, we would expect that stream to be sourcing rocks from its tributaries, from its headwaters. And so we'd expect a little bit more diversity in a river or stream system. Similarly, in a glacial environment, we would expect to see um, lots of different types of rocks, that the glacier is sourcing rocks from different regions. They're falling into the ice, moving with the ice sheet uh, down to the point where the ice melts and terminates. And we're just not seeing that here. Everything we're seeing in this landscape are these rounded granodiorite boulders. Sometimes they're out by themselves, just sitting on the ground. Sometimes they're stacked up on top of each other. And if we look at the ground, the interesting thing here is all we see forming the soil, the sediment, if you will, is disaggregated pieces of that granodiorite. So everything here is speaking to a uniform composition. Well, let me take you over to the clipboard and a little diagram I put together that explains how these rocks formed. Because believe it or not, these granite boulders were not transported at all. They actually formed these rounded shapes in place without being transported at all. So here's our fun little diagram. Now let's start up here. So we have a landscape dominated by this granitic rock. And these rocks form in the Jurassic period, 
But over time, they're subjected to tectonic stresses, compression, extension, different mountain building events, and so they develop fractures, okay, as shown with these dotted dashed lines here. So in this case, I've drawn, drawn mainly vertical and horizontal fracture lines. Over time, though, what happens is water can infiltrate along these fractures, dissolve away uh, some of the rock through a process called hydrolysis. It turns out that the feldspars are prone to dissolution and they actually break down and turn into clay minerals. So there's that process. We might near the surface also have water getting down into the fractures and during processes uh, where it's cold and we have frost action or freeze thaw cycles, we can start to split apart the rock that way. And then another process that might come into play is the fact that these granitic rocks formed underground under immense pressures and now they're here at the surface and the rock actually expands outwards it's the pressure has been released and so these rocks actually exfoliate and break outwards so the point is that these fractures which shows up as squares and rectangles here or they define squares and rectangles but if you think in three dimensions these would be three-dimensional corners like the corner of your table or desk so that over time you're going to get more uh, weathering at these intersections of fractures as opposed to any other area because there's more surfaces and more three-dimensional faces for the weathering processes to uh, sort of um, interact with and sort of ex ex enhance the, the, the weathering and the breakdown of the rock. So over time what we might get is something like this where we have granitic rock down at the base of the outcrop but near the top of the outcrop we've got this weathering turning into these rounded rocks going on. Here's the fractures horizontally and vertically, but now they've been enhanced and so they're isolating these individual blocks and turning them into more rounded shapes. Notice the ones at the top are a little bit more rounded. The ones just below are a little bit more primitive in their development, so they're more square or rectangular, rectangular in shape, but they're starting to develop these rounded corners. And then we have the area below that that's even more primitive and starting to develop. Well, if you allow this to play out even more, what you might see is something like this, where now the blocks are completely isolated. They might still be stacked one on top of each other, or possibly they've tumbled off through the expansion of free saw cycles. Maybe there's a regional earthquake or something else that causes one to tumble, but these rocks end up becoming rounded over time. And this is a collectively, this is a process known as spheroidal weathering, just taking these formerly intrusive igneous rocks like granite and weathering them with a variety of processes into the rounded shapes we see here today. So if you look at, for example, this little uh, stacked up sequence here, it looks a lot like what we see right here in front of us. This one here kind of reminded me of a snowman with the three distinct kind of sections. And if you look at the top block, it's a little bit more rounded in shape and then these bottom two blocks here separated by these fractures have a little bit more of a rectangular shape to them they're maybe a little less well developed but eventually these can fall off and tumble there's one here kind of in the shade that's uh, very spherical this one right here uh, very rounded and spherical um, same with this one just over here and so you end up with just these piles of rounded boulders uh, sitting on this landscape other places we can see nearby, just across the way, uh, there's a whole outcrop over here that's kind of undergoing this process. I don't know how well that shows up here, but that whole outcrop out there has some of the fractures and you can see some of the spheroidal shapes starting to develop in that outcrop. So again, spheroidal weathering, um, and this all takes place in situ, in, in place. These rocks have been shaped and, uh, and rounded solely in place, not transported at all. So a little different process than maybe the ones we're sort of used to here. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, let me swing the camera around. There we go. I'm using a new camera now, so I'd love to hear your comments about the quality of the video and the audio. Hopefully those turned out really well. Um, this one's nice because it has a zoom feature on it and I'm pretty happy and excited with the possibilities of using this new camera as opposed to the old one, which was a GoPro and worked okay, but I don't think it had uh, some of the, the resolution optically, didn't have a zoom feature, 
and was a little problematic, but still worked okay. So thanks again for your time. Hopefully this was helpful to you and thanks for your support of the channel. And we'll go ahead and sign off from the scenic rounded boulders of Northern Nevada.